believe now we are live on Facebook, so welcome to everyone who's joining us from all over the world. We are currently now national around the UK. Uh, we are in the USA, Canada, and even Oatby. So it's a, a very important day. Oatby, for those viewing, is a, is a local town. Um, thanks for joining us. Life on the Level support group for anyone with, with balance disorders. Um, we are privileged today that we have with us Professor Peter Ray, a consultant, ear, nose and throat surgeon, and he hates me saying this, world-renowned balance expert, and he is genuinely. Um, Professor Ray's presentation is the three recent developments in the world of balance. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session uh, with live audience and any Facebook live viewers are encouraged to submit your questions while Professor Ray is giving his presentation. Uh, we will then try and select the best questions to put to Professor Ray. So, uh, without further ado, we're very lucky to have Professor Ray here with us. Um, he has been working very hard to create this presentation for us. Uh, Rumour had it up until two o'clock this morning. So thank you very much, Peter, doing that, that great work. And I'm now going to hand you over to Professor Ray, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, who's come. What a fantastic number of people here. I'm really impressed on such a beautiful day. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, because this is, this is my life, too. Uh, and I hope I can share with you, from perhaps my side of the table, how I see balance and, and where we're going. And Kevin's given you an incredibly moving and real story. And I can see how a lot of what he said hit home. And I see that every day in my life, um, in the balance clinic. It's a really distressing set of circumstances you all find yourselves in, all in different ways. And from my side, medically, we're, we're doing our bit, hopefully to help you as individuals get better, but also to help um, science so whole communities can get better. So I'd like to thank, of course, Kevin, uh, thank RuPaul for all the work she's put in here uh, as well, and Karen from the London Ray Clinic, which might just have popped out, which is very kind of her giving up her Saturday as well, to come over and support us and provide all the, the goodies here as well. So, let's get going. Um, it's a huge topic. Whenever I'm asked to talk on balanced medicine, I always take a deep breath and I say, well, I'm going to talk you through a textbook of medicine, because anything can cause dizziness. It's a huge topic. And what we're going to do next today is just pick out three of the key ones, which I know several people in the audience today have got, and I'm going to run through a number of different conditions and where we're going. And this is just a taste of where we're going. We have new toys to torture you. This is real. This is one of my moments. I'll talk to you about this later. We have operations that I know some of you in the audience have had deep inside the head. And I'll talk you through those as well. But we're going to start off by asking why we're here. I'm going to give you a very brief summary of how I think. And then we'll run through those three diseases, BPPV, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, many ears disease, and a new one, which you may or may not have heard of, triple PD. And then, very briefly, uh, summarise where I think we're going to be going with research, just from Leicester, a huge amount of work we're doing here, some amazing teams. Now, for such an under-the-radar symptom, 20% of the population experience dizziness every year. Think of Leicestershire, population 1 million. 200,000 people a year in Leicestershire experience some dizziness. Okay, maybe much of it's trivial, but not all of it is. 5% of the population experience vestibular vertigo. Now, vestibular is a word you're going to hear a lot in the next half hour or so, and that's dizziness related to the ear balance organ or its central brain connections. 5% of the population, 50,000 people a year in Leicestershire alone, Look at the next line. How many 
appointments do we have at the Leicester Balance Centre, one of the biggest centres in the UK? This is new and follow-up appointments, 7,000 a year. Now, when I started here 15 years ago, we had 2,500 appointments a year, and I've worked and worked and worked to build it up to 7,000. But you can see we're not scratching the surface. And so there are ways we are going to try and address that. And we find throughout the world that there's enormous delay in misdiagnosis, as Kevin has alluded to. And again, much more eloquently than I ever could, uh, Kevin has described how dizziness is a hidden condition. You're suffering, your life is being torn apart, all your dreams are being taken away, and no one can see it. And some people don't even believe it. And that's a very difficult place to be. And you can see in those numbers that about one in five people with chronic balance conditions lose their job, take early retirement. It's a massive burden on society. So I hope, I hope, I can give you a little bit of hope today. So how do I address you when you come in to see me? How do I think? Well, the first thing I do is I try and divide the dizziness you're experiencing into two main groups. So is this episodic, intermittent vertigo, spinning, or is it a chronic or relapsing unsteadiness or disequilibrium? Now, you can have both, and that's one of the difficulties with balance problems. You often have several different conditions working together. And so, uh, one of the professors at the university here, Professor Hughes, who actually spoke, I think, at one of your meetings earlier on, and we're doing some quite exciting things together, um, said, look, well, I don't really understand this. Can we present this in a way that people would understand? So what we did is we put together this very simple chart, and you can put in balance disorder spectrum, and it's in a prettier way now online. And we divided it into vertigo, so that's the spinning, disequilibrium, uh, imbalance, and a lightheaded sensation. And then I think about, is it coming from the inner ear, or the brain, or nerves, or the heart, or from other systems? And I have lots of questions I'll drill down on to try and work out which it might be. And if you want to look at that online, you can get the system online, and you can click on each of these diagnoses, weird and wonderful, or common as they might be, and you can get a very brief description of each of those conditions. We may expand this over time. And then thinking about the two groups of diagnoses, for those with recurrent vertigo, episodic spinning, there are three common diagnoses. And you can have all three together to make it more difficult. BPPV, the crystals in your ear, which we're going to talk about in more detail. Meniere's disease, a fluid buildup in the inner ear, which we're going to talk about in more detail. And vestibular migraine, something that's becoming, we're becoming increasingly aware of and affects 1% of the population. A huge number of people have vestibular migraine, and often in association with the other conditions. And then there's a whole bunch of rarities that I'll explore for when I see you. And then there's chronic disequilibrium, most commonly in an ENT clinic, we'll see vestibulopathy. That's damage and weakness to the inner ear from whatever cause it might be. And we can usually treat that reasonably successfully. Or it could be brain-related, or there may be multiple contributors to it. Or more recently, we've evolved a term of triple PD to explain many of the symptoms of patients who have chronic, difficult to diagnose and difficult to manage imbalance. I'll take you through that in a lot more detail a bit later on. So I'm going to talk about two of the archetypal vertigo conditions and one of the newer, difficult to understand concepts of chronic imbalance. So let's look at BDPV. BTPV, I can diagnose in three or four seconds of you walking into the room. Now, many people have heard of it now. It wasn't that long ago it was first described, in fact, the treatment. It's remarkable how recently we've understood this, just over the last 30 or 40 years. And certainly when I came up to Leicester 15 years ago, everyone with dizziness who came to me had many years disease, allegedly. And then everyone had DPPV. <laughs> Now everyone's got vestibular migraine. It's a journey, isn't it? And of course, some people have got one of each. And you can diagnose this very, very quickly. I'm dizzy doctor, lying down in bed, rolling over, looking up or down, getting up in the morning, going to the dentist, going to the hairdresser, putting the washing out on the line, putting the teacup up on the top shelf. You've got BPPV, I'll get you better in 30 seconds. No, you can't, I've had it for years. Yes, I can. And it's a miracle. It's that easy. And in fact, we had a lovely lady who um, 
we, Doreen, who we did a documentary on uh, a few years ago, who had this from the age of uh, 16, she was now 76, and she had this plus testiculopathy, and we got her better in about four months. After 60 years of dizziness, and that, that, was, that was on TV. It can, it can be done. And some people, I'm not gonna look anyone in the eye because I know who you are in the room, don't get better from this condition. So well, I'll get 70 to 80% of my patients better at the first visit, and 90% at the second visit, and then the words I always use, I have 10% of troublemakers. <laughs> um, we, we, it is difficult sometimes, because those little, those little things come back, and very rarely we have to do other things. And it can be really distressing. And I know it can, because my wife gets it, and gets incredibly distressed when she gets it. It's a horrible condition, actually. And it's incredibly common. So it affects about 1% of people a year, and 2 or 3% of us will get it sometime in our life. That's really common. And it's something that gets commoner as you get older. And although I've said it's usually 30 plus, it's not always. I've had two patients of 8 years of age with BPPV, and then it gradually increases with age. Now, this is the bit I've been a bit nervous about for today, uh, because I have put some medical stuff in. And the reason I have, forgive me if it's a little complicated, um, but I wanted to do it because I know so many of you are so well read and so knowledgeable, uh, and I hope, I hope it adds a depth to your understanding of the condition. Because one of the things I believe very strongly is that you need to understand the condition that I'm treating for you. And I think that, that helps us get through it together as well. So BPPV is little crystals in your inner ear. So we're going right into the middle of your head here. This is the utricle and saccule. They're meant to be there. They're full of little crystals. When you put your foot down in your new sports car, you feel like you're accelerating. The weight of the crystals get forced backwards. So they do good. But when they break off, they go into the wrong place. So they come along here, and by gravity, they fall into this semicircular canal. And when you roll over or look up, they roll around. And as they roll around, they stimulate your eyes to move in an opposite and equal direction. And if you have an abnormality in the lateral canal here, which is in this plane, as I turn my head side to side, to me my eyes are still, but to you my eyes are moving side to side in my head. And the reason they're moving is the fluid in that canal. But if your crystals come back down here, oh, they make your eyes spin in a circle. Torsional, upbeat, geotropic, nystagmus. And that causes a short, intense spinning. And occasionally, they stick onto a jelly pad in here, the sensor, and that can produce a different type of dizziness, a more intractable dizziness. Now, we're always taught that these are rocks or crystals. They're not. They're things of great beauty. They're living parts of you. And what we're beginning to understand is BPPV is not a chip, chip, chip rock coming off a rock face. It's a dynamic biological process, just like osteoporosis. It's very analogous to that as well. And it has a collagen glycoprotein matrix, and calcium is laying over it. And many and fish have these, all animals have them. This is how we, how we balance. And traditionally, we try and get those crystals back in the right place. Epley maneuver, rolling you over, or plant of exercises, like side to side, it's all a miracle, fantastic. But it doesn't always work. So we have some other things to do. And here are the three things that I'm going to talk about. The first is a chair, which we can use to reposition the crystals. We have the second one in the UK. And this is my long-suffering, wonderful audiology colleague in the infirmary, Liz Morgan James, who has worked her socks off to get the funding for this. Now, we haven't used it on patients yet, but we're only using it on each other. <laughs> Ripple's face says, I want to be next. No, no way. Okay, now, you can see that, that what we're doing is we're, we're banging to try and loosen the crystals, and some of you who have been with me will know that I shake your head, that's the analogy to that. And then what we're doing is we're rotating in the plane of that canal at high speed. <laughs> and um, displacing crystals. So, Michaela down here um, is uh, one of our audiology scientists and is looking forward to doing it to you at some stage. She has an evil streak. 
Okay. So, but we have this technology to use, and you know, it's been um, a, a labour of love getting funding for this, uh, and we hope it will help a lot of people. And that really nervous looking chap there. That's me. <laughs> I felt if I'm going to do it to my patients, I have to have it done to me as well. And so we can treat superior canal VPPV, and here we can rotate you through treating lateral canal VPPV. So those crystals can be in lots of different places. Now, I said it was analogous to osteoporosis, calcium metabolism. And in fact, we found that vitamin D deficiency, vitamin D is the sunshine hormone, it's in a few foodstuffs as well, but the sunshine hormone, and we found that it's commoner in people with very low vitamin D. That's interesting, isn't it? And that's why I said it's a living dynamic. It's not a rock. This is a biological process. And so we found that it's commoner in winter. Interesting, isn't it? So you get less sunshine those with low vitamin D. And we're beginning to find that there's emerging evidence that if you take vitamin D supplements, you can reduce your recurrence rate of vitamin D. And BPPV can be a primary diagnosis, but for many of you with chronic balance disorder, many areas of vestibulopathy, you'll have BPPV intermittently as well. So there is an essentially risk-free, cheapest chips, non-medical treatment. You can go and get some vitamin D over the counter without seeing a GP. What a wonderful thing. Now, some of us measure the vitamin D, that can be useful. Some of us give huge loading doses of vitamin D bolus to try and get the levels up. Some of us just say, hey, just take some vitamin D for six or 12 months and see if it makes a difference. So we're working on this, and there's an easy win for you, potentially. But even despite all of this, we still have some patients who we just can't get better. And in the major international centres, uh, tertiary referral centres for end-stage centres like we have in Leicester, we would estimate that about 1 in 200 people we can't fix with all of these other techniques. <coughs> and we end up operating um, to close off the canal because these are real things. And in fact, we have three patients who we've operated on both ears, and there's only a very small number of people in the world who have had that. Um, and it can be successful. Just to give you a bit of anatomy. So this is a CT scan, x-ray scan, and we've chopped off the top of someone's head, so looking up from underneath. So the eyes and the nose are at the front here, and this is the ear, like, like this, yeah. This is the left ear over here, and this is the mastoid bone, just behind your ear. And this is the lateral canal, semicircular canal, this is the posterior semicircular canal, and this is the brain at the back. So what I do is I drill all that bone out there, the mastoid bone here, with the brain above and below it. Come down to the labyrinth, the balance organ, and then open up the posterior semicircular canal and put a, a bone graft in it, and the crystals can't move. And very occasionally, you can even see the crystals in there if there's a clump of them, it's extraordinary. So then, to me, I can bring this disease alive to you with the next video. So this is me operating. And I've drilled out the side of someone's skull onto their labyrinth, and I used a one millimeter diamond bird. Do you see that tiny tube there? It's amazing. To see this completely brings the disease to life. It's no longer this mystery of crystals. This is a real entity now. So these are micro needles, tiny, tiny drill. And inside this bony channel, the one I showed you the hole on, is this membrane. And through this tiny membrane go these even tinier crystals. That's what's causing your PPPV. As the crystals move through there, they stimulate the brain to thinking you're moving in a way that you're not. And if you put a graft in there, a bone graft, you can include that, and with a high degree of success as well in preventing recurrences of BPPV. No surgery is perfect, everything has risks. But for those who are intractably, distressingly, affected by this condition, there is a cure, potentially. Okay, that's BPPV. Let's move on to another one. Many years disease. This is your second, second disease today. And you can see the same picture again. Because over here, 
There's our posterior semicircular canal I put a graft in. And this is where the endolymphatic sac sits. So it sits between the ear and the balanced part of the brain. And in fact, some patients who have had both Meniere's disease and BPPV, I've operated on both at the same time. So this is the same view, but this is a surgical picture I've taken with an endoscope. So this is the ear bone at the front. This is the cerebellum, the balanced part of the brain at the back, which I push back. And this is the endolymphatic sac, which sits here. And we can take out the endolymphatic sac, and I can include the posterior canal at the same time. Now, I'm a surgeon, so I can do these things, but goodness, I don't do them very often, because I get nearly everybody better with medicine or other treatments. But they, they are options. And again, you can see that while these are distressing symptoms, they have a physical cause, a physical origin. Now, to diagnose many disease, the international classification has changed. And you'll see the American Academy have given two potential diagnoses, both definite Meniere's disease and possible Meniere's disease. And in fact, they've narrowed it down from, thankfully, definite, certain, probable, and possible to these two here. Because in the past, to have definite Meniere's disease, you have to be dead, because it was a pathological diagnosis. And I, to our American colleagues, forgive me, that always amused me. Um, so I'm rather glad that we have only got definite probable It's a good thing. But it shows us something. It shows us that it can be difficult to diagnose, particularly early on. So you might present to us with fluctuating tinnitus, pressure and hearing loss. And we say, well, I'll say to you, well, it might be many S disease, but you've not got any vertigo. Or it might just be vertigo without those. So then you have to understand from our side of the table, the diagnostic uncertainty. And I'll always say to you that making a diagnosis is like a jigsaw. And the more bits of the jigsaw I can get, the closer to a true diagnosis I can give you. But I don't necessarily, in fact, rarely have all of those pieces of the jigsaw. jigsaw. So we have to live with some uncertainty. And that's one of the, the pressures or the excitement for the doctors made the point of view of balanced disorders. It is challenging for, for the patient and for the doctor. But essentially, many years is a tax of vertigo lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours, usually preceded by a fullness of pressure in one ear, a low frequency tinnitus, and a hearing loss with fluctuates. That's relatively straightforward. Or is it? <laughs> because vestibular migraine can present with vertigo lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours, tinnitus, or fullness, and a low frequency hearing loss. Uh, difficult. And of course you can have both. So it's not so easy. And we have to make a best guess judgment. Usually it's straightforward, but not always. Many ears affects people in middle age most commonly, affect both ears. In fact, in up to 50% of our patients it can affect both ears. And that's really scary. So we want a treatment that is protective of the ear and not destructive. And that's what we're trying to develop. And whereas vestibular migraine affects one in a hundred people, many ears affects about one in a thousand. And here's how I think about many ears. I don't think about it as a disease in isolation. I see it as five diseases in one. So you have many ears, and about 40% of my many ears patients have migraine as well. See how difficult it is making the diagnosis now. And 20% have BPPV as well. So we don't want to mix up a BPPV relapse with a many years relapse. And most people will have some degree of imbalance because the inner ear has been damaged, vestibulopathy. And everyone will have a degree of emotional reaction, be it anxiety or depression. Because we are humans, we are not robots. We cannot cope with this. And particularly if we've got migraine, and I suspect a lot of people in the room have got migraine, and forgive me just for giving a little migraine aside, but migraineurs are special. Migraineurs are different. The brain is different. Because migraineurs are sensitive to everything around them, be it light or noise or daily hassles. That's a migraine brain. And imagine if you then go and get this catastrophic balance condition 
affecting the migraine brain. It's incredibly distressing. And I have some sympathy. Um, you will see I only drink water and no caffeine. Migraine's horrid, and it makes a lot of things in life horrid as well. We've got lots of treatments. Whoa. Do a huge number of things, from ranging from nothing to opening up your skull and cutting the nerve from your brain to your ear. And thankfully, we virtually never have to do that. But there are some treatments which are new, which I hope you will be interested in listening to. Now, the first one, anyone with many ears in here, and actually, I suspect a lot of people without many ears in here, not in the US, because I believe it's only available in Canada, not the USA. I think I'm right on that. Beta histine, or beta cirque, or cirque. So here's an interesting journey through medicine. It's a really safe medicine. It's been used for decades. It's the mainstay of treatment. It's marketed for many ears disease, amongst a number of other medicines. And we can give really high doses, and we, we've convinced ourselves we think it works. Well, one of our very clever European colleagues published in the BMJ, British Medical Journal, in January 2016. He looked at all of the data that have been collected on these, and he also then did a study where he used a high dose of CERC, high dose of beta histine, and looked at the number of attacks before treatment and at the end. And you can see very clearly, high dose of beta histine leads to a big reduction in many of his attacks. Then he used a low dose of beta histine. You see equally clearly, this is time, this is number of attacks. Over time, with low dose beta histine, the number of attacks fell. And that's what we've believed to be true. And that's really exciting. Except if you take a placebo, a sugar pill, you get exactly the same response. So the evidence actually is probably that beta histine doesn't reduce the number of vertigo attacks in many years. Now, I see one or two perplexed faces in the audience, and I kind of get that, because it may be that there are some people who are very sensitive to beta histine, and it does help, and it's washed out by the statistics. This is the problem with research, because many years is probably more than one condition. It just produces the same symptoms at the end. And you then lead on to the question, well, is it ethical for me as a doctor to prescribe a drug when I have this information saying it might not work? Well, I think it is ethical because it's safe, and it is a vestibular sedative, so it does reduce symptoms of balance disorder. And for some people, it seems to be a lifesaver. So we do still prescribe it. But I'm showing this to you because it's new information, and it challenges our assumptions. And you have to do that in medicine the whole time. And you'll see me, if I see you in clinic, I will challenge what I've said to you before. I will ask myself, was I right? Have I missed something? And we have to do that the whole time in medicine and with science here. And here's something else to challenge us. For perhaps I don't know, 20 years, I've given intratympanic steroids. So that's injecting a steroid drug through the eardrum under local anesthetic in clinic. If you sound a bit squeamish on that, don't worry, it's absolutely fine. Um, I'll show you some pictures later on. Um, and we think it works pretty well. Ripple's just not a believer today. Nope. <laughs> and I'm going to talk you through a journey. Two research projects I'm involved in. Really important research project. The first is with a big, very, very well-funded Californian stock market listed company, Autonomy. And there's a financier in California, a tech financier, who got many years disease, and went to the university and said, cure me, here's a, I don't know what the numbers were, here's $100 million or whatever. And, and then they listed on the stock market and got a huge amount of money. Amazing, amazing person. Amazing group of people to set this company up. For, me, for balanced medicine, to get that type of investment, incredibly exciting. And they developed um, a medicine called O2104, which is a, um, a liquid when it's cold, and then it turns to a gel when it goes in the ear, and they mixed it with a steroid. And what they found is that, oh, I'm sorry, that's really faint. Forgive me, I can't see that. But essentially, if you just put the steroid in on its own, it's out the ear very quickly. And if you put it in with the gel, it stays around for many, many days, a month or more. So the steroid is treating the ear over a very long period of time. So we had great hopes for this, and I've been involved in several trials with them. Um, I can only say what has been published, because I'm involved in the latest study, and 
because it's a stock market listed company, I'm not allowed to say anything beyond that. So these have been authorized by the company, the slides I'm showing you. But you'll see in the early results, there was a real trend to in reduction in vertigo. So the higher the dose of this drug you gave, the less vertigo you got. Um, and same with the frequency. So we were really excited by these early, early studies. And the same with the tinnitus stuff. Big reductions in tinnitus for the scientific here just misses statistical significance. So we need to get to a certain level to say, yup, that, that's probably not a chance finding. But it all looked really good. And then they published this, their results. And are these the results we want? Look, imagine, what's the number up there? 20, uh, 17, 18, down to not, almost not one and a half or two. Imagine reducing the number of attacks like that. Unfortunately, that's the autonomy stock price when the results were announced. <laughs> Didn't work. The results weren't statistically significant enough to publish. So, from all of our excitement, and we've put you know, lots of people, put, the company in particular, put years of work into this, and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, and they didn't quite get significant. And there are lots of potential reasons for that. It doesn't necessarily mean the drug's not working. It may be there were too many people with migraine in the study. Maybe they, they had migraine attacks after. There were lots of reasons the company thought about. So we're now doing a final study here. So don't write this drug off yet. Um, and um, we are recruiting patients. In fact, anyone who has a pure one-sided Meniere's disease with hearing loss, who hasn't had injections or surgery before and doesn't have migraine, um, please get in touch through GP um, if you're local or there are centers around the, the country. And indeed, in, in the US, it's being run. It's a big international study. But it's very, very difficult to, us, to recruit for us because the disease has to be so pure to see if we can reach statistical significance. So I want you to know that there are tens and hundreds of millions of dollars being pumped into the inner ear, research-wise, but it's incredibly challenging. It's not easy to do these type of studies. It's incredibly expensive to do these studies. This isn't commercially available because it hasn't been proven to work yet. If it is, it's been really exciting for everybody. I have a completely open and neutral mind. As a scientist also, I don't know what the results are, and we'll wait and see. But we hope you all know next year. Well, let's move on to a completely different study, which I've been deeply involved in, um, which has been very successful. And this is with a, another steroid, a very high concentration of steroid called solumedrone. Now, the brains behind this study, uh, Professor Adolfo Bonstein at Imperial, his colleague, Johnny Harcourt, who's a good friend as well, an EMT surgeon, and a whole group of scientists down at Imperial. Uh, and in Leicester, I joined them a little bit later in the study, so it was a two-centre study, and thank you to everyone who helped us get involved, because you completed this landmark study for us, which is actually going to change and has changed the lives of many people around the world. And this is a study that was funded by many years patients. Isn't it extraordinary? Many years society patients provided £280,000 to run this study out of their own pockets. Not a commercial study. No one made any money from this. It's a cheap drug. And so to, the, the power of what we can do together is phenomenal. And I'll take you through this. We inject a little bit of cream into the ear. Now, this is my mother-in-law. <laughs> who we treated last week. She's not got many ears, but she's got a similar condition which we can use steroids for. So she's very kindly allowed me to model her. Uh, I'm not allowed to treat her, because, well, I probably can, but I think it's unethical. Uh, so I have a colleague treating her. And these, um, this is my wife's fingers, actually. She, she's only modeling, putting the cream in. Um, it was a technical issue. The person who put them in was out room at that point. Um, but she came along for moral support. So if we put some cream into the ear to anesthetize the ear. This is, just, this is just last week. And then my fellow, uh, Jürgen Salman, and I am, I am blessed to be at Leicester with the colleagues I have. He, he's an amazing individual. With a PhD from UCL in London. Um, he's, he's on his second fellowship. He's over here now. and I'm, Hopefully he'll stay as well. And we're doing lots of really exciting research. So there he is, Jürgen, injecting this drug 
to my slightly worried little mother-in-law, and she needed two injections a week apart. Now, that's not clear. It's that easy. A little bit uncomfortable that those of you who've had it, I'm not going to pretend it, not uncomfortable sometimes, but no one's not come back with the second injection. There's one or two smiles, okay, forgive me. But look at the results. This is published in the Lancet. It's something I'm incredibly proud to have been asked to be involved with. They're one of the world's leading journals. It was published in November 2016. At two years after treatment, there was an average 90, 90% reduction in vertigo for essentially a risk-free treatment. We haven't any side effects from it at all. And my colleagues down in London have done a wonderful job following up all of, most of the patients for five years. That's an incredible achievement in research. And at five years, there's an average 95% reduction in vertigo. This is work funded by you, by many of its patients. And I'm lucky enough now to go and lecture around the world to do this. China recently, I just booked a ticket to Uzbekistan yesterday. So we get asked to go everywhere to lecture on this. And this is changing lives. Safely and simply and cheaply. So there are things out there that work. And if you're into graphs and charts, this is um, the number of many as attacks in the six months before treatment, average of 20. This is the number of two years in the six months, one or two. This is the number of attacks in the month before treatment, six or seven. This is the number in the month before two years, naught to one. Stunning results. And look at these other parameters as well. Vertigo symptom scale, dizziness handicap index, all better. Tinnitus, better. Oral fullness, better. Now there's two lines on there you'll see, because we use gentamicin in one arm and the steroid in the other arm. Um, and there's not much difference, yet gentamicin is a much riskier treatment to use. Some of you need it, and some of you in this room have had it. I know. But if the steroids don't work, we can then use that as another sort of second bite of the cherry. But we have these very low risk treatments now, uh, and I hope and I think they're changing lives around the world. And even after injecting my mother-in-law, I promise you we're still friends. So that's my, that's my wife, and uh, that's my mother-in-law, only last week. So she survived the treatment. Okay, and just a final note on Menius disease. Um, we're setting up a registry fund. Menius Society have given us over £100,000. So some of you have been involved. Um, we will be asking, what we're interested to know is what your symptoms are through your whole life. <coughs> because well, I, you'll ask me, well, what's the chance of me getting in the second ear doctor? And I can give you the stats, but I can't tell you individually because I don't have enough data. And what we're going to try and do is develop this into a national registry, which will cost several million pounds to run, believe it or not. And then over the years, I'm hoping we'll be able to get that information for you and for people in the future who get, who get many AIDS disease. So, third and final, you've, you've been very patient and tender, I'm impressed. Um, so we're going to go on to the third condition now, uh, which is a chronic imbalance. And you may or may not have heard of this condition. And it's persistent postural perceptual dizziness. We term it triple PD rather than PPPD, because that sounds too much like PPPV. And then we get into sort of alphabet spaghetti. So, triple PD, it's a relatively new diagnosis and there's some interesting new investigations. So, let's just take a little step back for 15 seconds of anatomy. Where we've been so far is here in the inner ear. So, many ears diseases in the inner ear, BPPVs in the inner ear. We kind of get that, we know a bit about that now. And the signals relay into the brainstem. And we kind of got a bit of an idea about that now from our research. And we know that this information comes from your vestibular spinal tract, from proprioception, from sensation, from your muscles. We sort of know that. And we know that information comes in from your eyes through these big, thick, myelinated medial longitudinal fasciculus. That's where MS, for example, starts to pick things off. But then the plot thickens. Because then the information goes up to your cerebral cortex. This is the higher centers of your brain. It's what makes you human. It's the big bit of your brain. And here, we're beginning to struggle with our understanding. But we are beginning to open up what's going on. And this is absolutely the next frontier of balanced medicine. 
and I'll try and take you through a little bit of the excitement here at the moment. So here's the London Road Clinic. This is um, another one. That, actually, no, this is one of our staff here. That wasn't the patient. Um, and on this one, the floor and the walls move. I know several of you have been on this. Uh, and what this allows us to do is take apart the visual input to balance, the vestibular and ear input to balance, and the proprioceptive from your joints and muscles. And that gives us an idea of where the balance problem is and how we might best treat it. Now, just on the next slide, if you've got epilepsy or flashing lights you don't like, please close your eyes for the next slide. And we also have other ways that we can do this. So we have, uh, you can be in a supermarket, and we can uh, do a video posturography, and you walk down a supermarket aisle, because that's one of the common triggers. We can do these uh, lines, which have a different type of name, which break up the visual horizon. And there are lots of different ways we can do this. And we can try and help you with, uh, again, underneath, this is Liz again, she's long suffering. Uh, the floor is moving beneath her feet as she moves. The environment around her is moving. She's breaking health and safety laws. I should tell her off, she's not going to strap on. Um, and by doing this, though, we can reprogram the brain, get those connections between the eyes and the ears and the brains working, the brain working again. And that's where the problem is for a lot of people with chronic balance disorder. And this is immersive, so you're completely in this environment. You can see nothing else around you. This is the, um, this is the first one in the UK that we have. And that's a very, very expensive toy. Now, PPP, Triple PD, it's had a number of different names before, some of which were related, more or less. There are terms like chronic subjective vertigo, visual vertigo, phobic positional vertigo, patient space motion discomfort, and psychogenic gait disorder. The great thing you've got to try to get a term that explains everything. And it's actually very helpful, diagnostically and therapeutically, as you'll see, because it helps us guide you as to what's going on helps guide our research, and it helps guide um, treatment. So what might you experience with triple PD? This is not so great on this one. I'll just put the light out just so you can see this just for a second. I don't know if that's any better. So there's a, there's a non-spinning vertigo. I feel like I'm on a bow, so I feel I'm moving. Unsteadiness, I feel like I'll fall. Lightheadedness, I feel I might faint. Dissociation, I feel spaced out, I'm floating, my legs are on a sponge. It's worse when you're upright, it's worse in motion, and it's worse surrounded by motion. And often our patients with this will experience visual hypersensitivity. So anything going on around them, crowds, supermarkets are really unpleasant. Kevin, we can put those lights back on. Thanks. And it's often triggered by an initial vestibular event. So you might have had BPPV, vestibular neuronitis, maybe Meniere's disease, and, and that triggers something, but the brain adapts to it incorrectly. And it's that central, higher processing maladaptation that's the crux of triple PD. Some people with um, minor head injuries, whiplash injuries, so we see them in medical legal reports, this type of condition, and it seems very strongly associated with migraine. There's maybe a history of anxiety and depression before, or there may be a history of anxiety as a consequence of the onset of triple PD. And these are all mixed up together. Now I've tried to put that in English. This is the official diagnostic criteria. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, so essentially it's saying you need this non-spinning dizziness much of the time, but not necessarily all the time, for at least three months. And it's worse in motion and when you're upright. That's what sort of the technical gump is saying. And why does it happen? Well, that's me, and it's a few years ago with my children, uh, on the Inca Trail in Peru. There's a very, very, very big drop behind us. My wife is very, very, very scared of heights. She's taking the photo. <laughs> we then went on the Inca Bridge. Has there, anyone ever been to Machu Picchu? The Inca Bridge is built, it's a path, as wide as this table, built into rock. And I kid you not, it must be a 2,000 foot vertical drop below. Mm. Now, I'm not great with hindsight. I'm okay, but I'm not great with them. And I was 
feeling sick, I'm sweaty, I'm shaking, I'm absolutely rigid because I'm really scared. And that's one of the responses to balance disorder. And just as an aside, my kids were going, Dad, what's the problem? Look! <laughs> they were that close to the edge. I don't know how they do it. They, we didn't go, I had to drag them back, I was too scared. But that's a true response, and it's exactly what happened. But that's what also happens in Triple PD. Because our natural response is to stiffen up. If we're scared we're going to fall, we stiffen up like this, and that fear gets expanded. And also, we balance up the inputs to our brain in that first diagram I showed you, from our feet, proprioception, from our eyes and from our ears. And our brains might, from following an ear injury, try and use our eyes more, so more visual input to balance, than the vestibular ear input, and it overloads the visual input. And that's why you struggle in crowds and supermarkets. And so somehow in the higher processing, in the, the sort of super powerful cortex of your brain, the pathways are incorrect. They're, I often use a slice of golf as an analogy. It's really difficult to get rid of when you get there. And then those are the first two problems. And then the third problem is that your brain doesn't recognize those problems and correct them. Because of course most people who get a balance problem get better from it. But everyone here, and everyone I see, hasn't. And it's because the brain hasn't adapted to it. So we are now starting research on this. This was only published two or three years ago, this work. And we have uh, one, of, uh, one of my balance heroes, Professor Bronstein from London. One of his team is now up in Leicester and has set up a lab with lots of research on triple PD. So we may be calling some old friends in, we'll see. Um, and we've got lots, lots of, sort of brain type investigations we do. We've got lots of theories and ideas. This is one of our new new front, frontiers. But we can still individualize treatment, and this is one of the advantages of having a diagnostic term such as triple PD. Because by explanation and understanding, I think it's really important that you're not going mad, that you've not got brain rot, that you've not had a stroke. That's a really good starting place. And to know that most people get better, not everyone, but most people get better is a good starting place. We can use vestibular physiotherapy to desensitize the balance system. That's helpful in 70 or 80% of people. We can use um, medication, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And we can use psychological therapy, such as CBT. And Michaela, for example, works uh, down on the American Naples hypnotherapy. And although I haven't seen the research on that, for a lot of patients with chronic balance disorder, where stress and anxiety come in, it's been very successful, and I think the results have been really, really good. And you might want to speak to Michaela about that as well, if that's something that's uh, interesting to you. And the drugs that we use are SSRIs or SNRIs. Now, these are antidepressants, serotonin, from serotonin. And they may well help to reduce anxiety and distress in patients with triple PD, but that's not why they're helping the balance problem. If you don't have stress and anxiety, they're just as effective. So that's just a bonus. So they're doing something to the balance system, and we know that serotonin is part of the sort of messaging system in balance, to stabilize these incorrect messages that are going through your brain. And those who can manage it for 12 weeks, not everyone tolerates the drug, but those who can manage it for 12 weeks, we found uh, typically an 80% reduction in symptoms. And we recommend it's taken for a minimum of a year. And there's a range of different drugs we use. We can't characterize which is best for each individual at the moment. We sometimes have to move that around. But there's real hope out there. And this is all really new, new work that's coming through. So where are we going next? Last slide for you. Well, Leicester is buzzing with ideas at the moment. So we've teamed up with IBM, um, a professor in America who is one of the people who uh, was involved with the development of the World Wide Web and um, some of the information stuff that's sort of set up Google. He's teamed up with us and the University of Leicester. And we're trying to develop artificial diagnostic tools for balance disorders, which are hopefully ultimately will be online as well. It's really exciting. But that's going to be a multi million pound investment that's ongoing. 
The many years registry I've spoken to you about, we can try and get all of our many years patients involved so we can tell you what's happening in the future. The triple PD research, um, with the ethics proposals are in, the lab set up, that's all very exciting. And the steroid injections for the ear, we're um, getting on well with the study, it's not completed yet, and we certainly look forward to those results. And then harking back to our very first slide, where I said we have 50,000 people a year with vestibular inner ear balance disorders just in Leicester, and the numbers will be replicated in the States and all around the world, and we can only see 7,000 here. With some of this equipment we've brought in, we're going to have non-medically led balance clinics. So specialists like Michaela, who's an audiologist and scientist, and Liz, who you saw, our manager, who's an audiologist, will be running the clinic, some of our balance clinics, rather than me as an expensive doctor, to try and increase the volume of patients that we can see. And we'll have lots of protocols, so if it's complicated and so on, patients will come over to see me. And we're gonna try and work our way through this. So we're trying our very, very hard. It's supposed to understand conditions better, to find ways to treat them better, uh, these conditions better, and also to see more people, because we know that access is incredibly difficult. <coughs> and that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Bye -bye. Um, I know that uh, members of the group have uh, submitted some questions for you, um, and if you were one of those and you'd like to ask, ask your question directly yourself, then please kind of point yourself out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over there. I know lots of people on Facebook have got uh, comments and questions as well. So just tell us who you are and your question. I'm Rosalind Knight. Um, haven't been fully diagnosed yet. I can see where I'm going professor's talk today. I just wondered how long lasting the um, injections were. Um, well, for, for many instances? Well, you know, for in, the, the inflammation of the steroid. Is okay. It to, to reduce inflammation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very, very long lasting. Now, the actual drug in the ear peaks in concentration at two hours in the cochlea. cochlea. So very, very transient. It goes in, but it puts this mega pulse of steroid into the inner ear. And the concentration in the inner ear, the labyrinth in the cochlea where your many ears is, is 290 times higher, 290 higher, than if you injected it into a vein. And of course it's localized into the ear, so it makes it much safer. So our data is that at um, two years, there's a 90% reduction in attacks of vertigo, and at five years, a 95% reduction. Now that is much more dramatic than we anticipated. We, we were expecting, perhaps, we might get good relief for 8 to 12 months. And certainly, some people do need top-up injections. Not many, but because it's such a safe drug, if you get a relapse at 8 to 12 months, we can give you another course of steroids at that time. And in fact, there's some evidence emerging that the top-up injections are even more successful. So, the, so this is a long-term treatment. I, I, we know that the gentamicin, which is the ablative destructive drug you put in your ear, has a very long-term success rate. But also, there's probably about a 5% risk of losing your hearing with gentamicin, and quite a lot of people are quite unsteady afterwards for a period of time, and go off me for a few weeks, but all recover. <laughs> uh, and, and no matter what I say, it's always phone call. Uh, but, but it does work. But the, and particularly, see, particularly paradoxically, if you're young and you have it, you've got a whole lifetime to get many ears in the other ear. Well, well, no, that's a big thumbs down, I accept. But do you, do you see why I'm nervous yeah. of doing ablative treatments? We were perhaps more going home a decade ago. And it's a wonderful life-changing treatment, don't get me wrong. Gentamicin has changed many, 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 many people's lives. But there are risks, and there are even people who it doesn't work on brilliantly. And there's one person in this room who hasn't responded well to many of those treatments, and unfortunately is at the very, very severe end of the disease. But the steroids, to our enormous delight, the data we have would suggest they're very long. They work for a very long time. I hope that answers your question. Um, we've got lots of questions to get through, Peter. Uh, can vestibulopathy affect speech, including some slurring and mixing up of words? And this is a question from uh, our member, Richard Allen. The answer is yes and no. It doesn't cause slurred speech. So if you've got slurred speech, you've probably got a neurological problem, and you either need to see a specialist like me who knows about that, or perhaps even better, a neurologist, to make sure there's nothing going on in your brain. But you've got to be clear what you mean by slurred speech. Can it produce interruption of thought processes, forgetfulness, can't remember names, slowing down, 
Oh yeah, absolutely it does. And it's because your brain is using, and the way I like to think of it, is your brain is using every ounce of its energy to try and maintain your balance. And so without a shadow of a doubt, people become more forgetful, and stumble over their words, and feel they can't talk. But if you say to a doctor, I've got slurred speech, that's not an air condition. Yeah, completely different. A uh, question from Nicola, Nicola Morris, who again is one of our members here. Is visual vertigo the same as triple PD? That's a great question and a really difficult one. What's the difference? The answer, yet again, is yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, visual vertigo was a concept, about, again, Professor Bronstein, Dr. Bronstein, uh, published on 20 years ago. And it's essentially saying that your eyes have taken over part of your balance function. And that's great in a nice and quiet environment. But when there's movement and aisles in the shopping mall or crowds coming towards you, it overloads the system and can't work. So visual vertigo can be an isolated phenomena, particularly after an inner ear injury. So your brain tries to compensate for this inner ear injury. However, it can also be part and parcel of triple PD. So it's one of the characteristics of triple PD. So the answer is it can be either or. Okay, question from uh, Susan Barker. I'd like to know if there are any developments in the treatment for ossolopsia. Right, you are definitely trying to challenge me here. Another absolutely brilliant question. Ossolopsia is the world bobbing up and down. So you know the old-fashioned camcorders that didn't have image stabilisation? So you would go on your holiday like this and say, look at my pictures, and everyone's going, oh, because the horizon's bobbing up and down. That's ossolopsia. Now that's caused We'll forget other conditions, but it's caused by two principal problems. It's either caused by something in your brain, which might be a stroke or drugs, or it's caused classically by bilateral vestibular failure. So you lose function in both ears. Because you see, what you don't realise is when you walk, your eyes are doing this the whole time, because you're actually walking like this. So your inner ear alters the angle of your eye as you walk, and it keeps your horizon stable. And if you've got both inner ears damaged, and the classic two causes are head injury and gentamicin injected for infected hips and infected abdomens, it's catastrophic. It's an absolutely catastrophic injury, and it's very difficult to manage. And we use substitution exercises rather than adaptation, which Andrew Clemens, who I think is going to speak in the next meeting, I think, is that, he doesn't know this yet, but I think he, is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, 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 might, he might talk to you on. But it can also, just, just as a quick aside, it can, I've got quite a number of patients who've had a severe balance problem on one ear only, who also get oscillopsy. But to turn to the answer to the question, there are some drugs that are used the central oscillopsia, which I wouldn't prescribe myself, I would let the neurologist or neuro-ophthalmologist prescribe those. In the inner ear, we do use vestibular physiotherapy, um, because if there's some vestibular function left, we can help adapt to that. If there's none left, we can try and use other systems like proprioception and vision, which can help. And the real qu the question is really saying, yeah, that's all right, doc, but have you got a cure for it? <sighs> yes and no. <laughs> the the um, what we're trying to develop at the moment are vestibular implants. Now you've probably heard of a cochlear implant which goes into the inner ear to replace profound hearing loss. I mean, I've put 50 in, I think, and it's one of the most emotional things you can do as a doctor. Seeing a child who's never heard before, listen to their mother singing, it's an amazing experience. But we're trying to adapt those for vestibular function. There aren't difficulties, because if you put it into the inner ear balance organ, you lose all the hearing. And that's the problem. So we're sort of trying to stick them on the outside of the balance organ. And as doctors always say in this situation, we hope it will be ready in five to ten years. Okay. Very diplomatic answer there. And lots of people watching on Facebook, I'm just going to mention a few um, because they've been extremely patient and with us from the beginning. Uh, Polly, uh, Sheila, uh, Sharona, back, um, all watching. Uh, loads of other people as well. Emma's got a question for you. I think she's one of your patients. She's got vestibulopathy. Um, she also suffers with the vestibular migraine. Um, her question is about feeling nauseous, particularly, as well as treatment for the vestibulopathy. Is there, do you, do you, would you recommend something for, for the nausea itself? Yeah, and this is an interesting distinction. So inner ear problems are usually really unpleasant. They cause nausea and vomiting and dizziness. Central balance problems are usually less distressing. It's an interesting thing. Now, traditionally, um, stematil, protoporazine is given. And that's absolutely fine in the short term. 
we're very anxious that our patients don't take it long term for two reasons. One, you fail to adapt, and secondly, if you take it for years, you can get Parkinson's disease. And, and there is a really good analogy. Can I have 30 seconds for my analogy? And I'll use my aeroplane analogy. And this is a great analogy for um, anyone who's got an ear problem. So you're, we're an aeroplane now with a propeller on both sides. We have a bird strike on one propeller, so it goes out of action. You can do three things. You can do nothing, and you'll crash and burn, yeah? That's like taking to your bed. You, you'll never get better. The pilot can wrestle with the controls. Move the rudder, get the plane back on the straight and narrow. That's what vestibular physiotherapy does. Sure, a gust of wind will knock you off again a bit. You're not quite perfect, but it will make you better. And the third thing you can do as the pilot is turn both engines off. Now, if you turn both engines off, hey, dizziness stops and you glide. But you'll never fix the problem, and eventually you'll crash. That's what taking these drugs does. It turns the balance system off. So you feel better in the short term, but you never get better in the long term. So the answer to the question is vestibular physiotherapy is trying to get better. Make sure that any BPPV or other associated condition is treated so it doesn't cause relapses. And if you have bad periods, maybe drugs like sonarazine, Stugron, Arlevert, these type of medicines can be helpful. Lena's also watching on Facebook. Thanks for doing that, Lena. She's got a question. She's got BPPV and vestibulopathy with visual preference. Um, she is a smoker, but she's trying to give up. Does smoking affect uh, these conditions? Well, I'm going to say yes, even though it doesn't. Well, okay. I'm going to be. I'm going to put my son. That's, sorry, tongue in cheek. But um, I, I'm also going to put my academic hat on now. Because there are papers that have been published that show increasing white dots on MRI scan, and it was stiffening of the blood vessels in your brain, cerebrovascular disease, is associated with increasing imbalance. So if you have an imbalance problem at the moment, I don't know what age you are, um, the older you get, the more you smoke, the more damage you'll do your brain. I can't give you a paper to prove it, but it can't be a good thing to do. We've got, I, I, I'm not sure we're going to get through all the questions today. Um, I'm going to try and get through some more of the member questions. How was the original mixture injected into your ear originally determined to help with many ears, and does it matter where in the ear it is injected? This is from Peter. Okay, so if we take this back, there was a, an American surgeon called Shuknik who in the 1960s injected streptomycin, very powerful antibiotic, into the ear. Now, it was great because it stopped the vertigo, but it was a disaster because it destroyed the ear. So all the patients lost all of their hearing uh, and all of their balance on that side. So it completely fell out of fashion. No one did it for years. And then people started thinking, well, maybe many ears is an inflammatory condition. Hey, look, if I have a rheumatoid knee, I'd inject steroids into it, and the swelling would go down. Maybe, just maybe, it'll work. And we also knew that autoimmune inner ear disease, which is a analogous to many ears, but affects both ears, is exquisitely steroid sensitive if you take the tablets. So people started thinking, let's just try and put some dexamethasone in, and it's trial and error. Now, for the um, studies that I've been involved in, the, the one, the solumedrone study that was published in The Lancet, um, the design came from the team at Imperial, they're the leaders in this study, not me. Um, and we used to give, when we started using dexamethasone in the States, People would have come into hospital and have an injection every day for, for a week or so. Then they tried to reduce it. Then over here, I would give an injection once a week for three weeks. But we couldn't get a high dose over here. So we could only get 3.3 milli, 3 milligrams a mil of dexamethasone, which is you know, probably too low a dose. So we thought, okay, they're not manufacturing that. Let's find a drug that's got a really high steroid dose that we might be able to inject. It's not licensed, but we'll try it. So we, got solume, we thought solumedrone. And I started injecting that about 15 years ago, and I did two wonderful, wonderful ladies I injected 15 years ago, who all other treatments have felt, and it was incredibly painful for them, and they wouldn't go on and have further treatment. So then we sort of sat back and started thinking about it, and so we reformulated, and we thought, okay, we've got this study we can do, we certainly would never be able to manage one dose, two dose, three dose, no dose, you just can't do that in research. It's so expensive and so difficult doing research. So we said, look, probably two doses because this is a very high concentration drug. We'll put a slightly smaller volume in and we'll see what the study results are. This is the real world. You know, 
the re you can't do multiple variables in research. And so it's almost, I I'm not going to say we got here sort of by Brownian motion, if anyone's got the physics background, just sort of randomly coming left and right, but we got there by trial and error, and that, I'm afraid, is how medicine progresses. Ken um, has got a question for you about uh, beta histine. Um, a, recent, a GP recently said to him, beta histine medication is not well thought of in the profession. What are your opinions on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, that's a difficult answer. I mean, the, the, the data that was presented in January 2016 from Microstrop's paper in the BMJ suggested it probably didn't reduce vertigo attacks in many disease. But I do have a number of patients who say if they stop their beta histine, their many attacks come back. And so I absolutely prescribe it. But there are other papers which say that it is a vestibular sedative, so it's turning down the engines a little bit. And so your balance feels a bit better when you're on it. And it's a really safe medicine. If you've got asthma or stomach ulcers, you probably shouldn't take it. Some people get a little bit of nausea with it. But you can take super high doses with minimal side effects. And if nothing else is working, why not try it? So I think mixed reviews. OK, uh, there's a question from uh, Anonymous. Does the, uh, do the vast majority of serious um, balance conditions improve? You know, symptoms reduce, impacts on life, etc. Um, for example, many years burnout. And if they do improve, how big a factor of that perceived improvement is due to learning to cope with it or managing the condition? This is a, a question from uh, one of our members who didn't want to give their name. Yeah, I think the answer is probably yes, yes. So, if, but many years of vestibulopathy are very different. So, many years does burn out and it physically burns out. So, you've got a 60 decibel hearing loss, a significant reduction in balance function, and no flare ups of fluid to produce attacks. So, that, that does go. But it can be eight months or it can be 40 years. That's the problem with many years. And with vestibulopathy, absolutely you learn to adapt. And Michaela or Andrew Clements here can give you great physiotherapy exercises to help. And we know that about 80 to 85 percent of our patients benefit greatly from them, not everyone. And we also know that just doing this, just living, is a physiotherapy. So we encourage you to exercise and do as much as you can. And over time, adaptation occurs for most people and a reduction in symptoms. Uh, this is a question from Polly, who is also watching on uh, Facebook, but pre submitted this question. and. I have no idea how to pronounce this, so it's um, it's up to you. Uh, uh, you and your team plan to start using the optokinetic simulation protocol developed by the, lock, uh, the late Dr. Dai um, to treat people with... MDDS. MDDS. Yeah, so I, I, know the, I know the studies, yeah. Okay. So, um, she'd, she'd actually like to know if this protocol would help people um, diagnosed with triple PD. Yeah, I mean, uh, with triple PD or MDDS? Um, she's saying triple PD. Okay, yeah, okay, fair enough. So just to give you a little background on this, sorry about all the letters. So triple PD we've seen is something that's worse when you're upright, worse in motion, um, and generally better when you're lying still. Malda de Bakhamoff syndrome is another really unpleasant, and for people who've got it long term, it's really horrid, and they have the sensation that they're at sea all the time on a boat. But paradoxically, people with MDDS are better in motion um, and worse when they're lying still. Now, I, I, in my own medical mind, think of MDDS, Malda de Bachmann syndrome, in, in three different ways. Now, we all get it to a lesser or greater degree when we get off a boat. And I was actually just speaking to my wife about it over breakfast, and she said, I used to get that as a child, because she used to have to travel on, on a boat quite a lot. Um, she said, oh, for two days afterwards, I'd have sea legs and I'd feel like jelly all the time. It's a really horrible feeling. And if you imagine, um, you've got a gyroscope in your brain, which you haven't, but imagine you do. And then when you're on a boat, rocking side to side, it resets. So it gets used to the rocking. But then when you come off, it's still rocking, so it makes you feel so It's kind of a vestibular memory. So it's a natural response to have it for a very short time afterwards. For our patients with... Um, vestibulopathy, injury to, the, in, injury to the inner ear. The sensation of being on a boat, i.e. symptoms of mal de Bachmann, are very, very common. And that responds to um, traditional uh, vestibular physiotherapy. Now, um, pure mal de Bachmann syndrome is really distressing and horrid for people who have it, but it's a much longer term condition, often without a known trigger or cause. And treatment's much more difficult. 
Um, and the work from the American, um, there's really one centre in America who published on this a lot. Um, the, the question is whether their work might translate to triple PD. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint with the answer. The answer is I don't know, um, because we haven't done that yet. But the team we have set up, that will be one of the type of things that we're looking at. So it's a really good idea. Um, Alison wants to know, she's currently having to lie down, rest, sleep for a couple of hours in the day, and then rest up early in the evening too. Some days she's resting more than doing anything else. Is this level of fatigue uh, to be expected as part of a vestibular problem? And is it possible to get into a habit of resting too much? Yes and yes. Um, so anyone with a, any, with a chronic illness doesn't have to be just vestibular, but anyone with a chronic vestibular illness will have a whole range of symptoms that come with it. And fatigue is high up there amongst them, along with brain fog, neck ache, headache, forgetfulness, um, and all the other symptoms that go with chronic imbalance. And it, this concept of your using all of the energy you have in your brain to keep going, um, and you've got no spare capacity. So people do get very tired with it. And fatigue, chronic fatigue, is a very strong symptom that goes with this. However, we would always encourage our patients to mobilize and get out as much as they can for a whole host of reasons. Muscle strength, well-being, vitamin D, and all the movement you do is vestibular physiotherapy. So I'd really encourage our patients to try and be as active as they can and get something they enjoy. Uh, one final pre-submitted question, and then very quick opportunity for, for people here today as well, if that's okay, yeah. um, Peter. Generally speaking, across the majority of balanced conditions, can you give any observational examples of what not to do and what to do as a patient that aids living with the condition and minimising its impact on one's life? Wow, that's a hugely broad topic, isn't it? But it, 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 it's, it's a similar answer. Firstly, get a right diagnosis. I, I mean, I, I know Kevin was saying that diagnosis is less important. I, I think, I'm a doctor, understanding your condition is really important to start with. Making sure there's nothing else going on. So you've not got PPPV in addition to your vestibulopathy, or you've not got a chronic uh, neurological condition. Make sure nothing else is happening. Get to a specialist who understands the condition and not just be dismissed. Get appropriate physiotherapy if that's um, available to you and work hard at it. Keep as active as you can, keep a really healthy diet, and treat all the allied symptoms. So if you're a migraineur, don't have caffeine or coffee, keep your fluids up. Don't have cheese, chocolate, you know, all the things we go through for migraine. Make sure you don't have BPPV. Do exercise, do keep fit, do try and keep active, and if possible, do try and keep in work sometime. And the don'ts are do not take to your bed. It's the worst thing to do. To start with, I, I, can I jump in as well with, with, with a single question? Because I, uh, on so many occasions on my blog and, and meet people who have balanced conditions uh, from around the country, and I know a lot of people on Facebook have um, real issues with actually accessing um, uh, treatments and, and the correct help for diagnosing balanced conditions. I think we're quite lucky here in Leicester but it's not the same around the country. No, so I gave the Christmas lecture at the Royal Society of Medicine on this topic last year, and it was quite distressing. So I went around, lots of my friends and colleagues from centres around the country, and there are some hospitals where all the funding has been withdrawn. There is zero funding for balanced medicine and investigation. I mean, it's catastrophic, it's a disaster. But we tried, I worked with the Department of Health 12 or 14 years ago to try and get balanced services improved in the community um, in GP practices. It just, I'm sure there are one or two pockets of excellence around the country, but it just has not worked. So what I concluded in my talk at Royal Society of Medicine, and what I think is the right way forward, is that we try and bring balanced services in-house to specialist centres so people are experts in it. But there aren't enough of me, and there never will be, to treat all those people who need to be treated. And that's why people like Michaela, um, who have sat in for many years in clinic with me, who have gained expertise, and have me next to them for people who are difficult to manage, and have all this specialist equipment that we can use, will be seeing large volumes of patients. So for me, the way forward is that we have specialist centers, and we have uh, non-medically led clinics to increase the volume of people seen. And that's why I'm trying to champion 
You know, I've worked with the Department of Health in the past, um, and there is there is money there. People, I mean, the government does want to help, but we, we also have to show leadership. And I'm trying to find a cheaper and more effective way of treating large numbers of people, and, and that's what we're working at. Are there any more questions um, in the audience? Yes, could I ask one, please? It's nothing to do with many years, but um, I fractured my hip about four years ago, and um, I've also got a pacemaker. And my balance has not been fantastic. So I now go, uh, take myself to twice a week to the gym, Archway House, and I have one-to-one -one my core. Mm. Do you think this is a good idea? Yeah, so, so the question is um, that I fractured a hip four years ago. Balance has been poor since. Now, clearly that's not a vestibular problem, although your vestibular system may not be quite as sprightly as it was in the past. This is a muscular and proprioceptive and confidence problem. So as we get older, the causes of imbalance change. And we describe a multi-system balance disorder. And I always give this little talk to the junior doctors who come through in, the, in their 20s, and they get quite upset by it. And I say, as we get older, our, our eyesight's not as good as it used to be. And our love of food and our taste isn't as good. And our perception isn't as good, so we're not as tactile and don't get so stimulated. And our muscle strength isn't as good. And our memory isn't as good. And our adaptability isn't as good. And, and that's called getting old. But that's the reality of what happens when we get older. So if we have a fractured hip, we can't adjust so easily for that loss of muscle tone. And then we get fearful of falling. We have whole books on fear of falling. So then I'm not necessarily the right person to see in a balance clinic. And we have care of the elderly led clinics called falls clinics, which you may be seen by a physician who will make sure your drugs are right and so on, but you'll be put into a physiotherapy program with many others to get core strength, to uh, build your muscles up. You might have an occupational therapist come around to your house to give you grab rails, or may perhaps have a stick or a frame to help you walk to stop you falling. So it's a more holistic care for the whole of you rather than the more medical care that I do for specific balance disorders. And you're doing 100% the right thing, getting core exercises, keeping yourself dynamic, going to the gym, getting all that stuff done. It's the right thing to do, but it's a different way of managing a balance disorder. We've got so many other questions. I think we are going to call it um, a day. Um, but can we just say thank you very much indeed to uh, Professor Peter Ray for... Uh, I'm sure we're, we're all joining in saying that was a fantastic presentation. So, so much hope, um, so much good news there for all of us. So, and I, I especially hope our Facebook viewers um, saw that as well. Please pass that around to everyone and anyone. Um, what we've just heard for the last hour is just so, so good. Um, and Peter, fabulous presentation. We would listen to you for another three or four hours. <laughs> we, I think when you're back from Uzbekistan, we'll invite you again. And maybe, fin maybe finish off all the, uh, the questions that we didn't have time to ask, so apologies for that. Um, all of you viewing, thank you very much for joining us today, wherever you are in the world. Uh, please like us, follow us, share with as many people as you can. Uh, we're on Twitter as well, at Life on Level 1. So please spread this fantastic news and the information from Peter. And Peter, on behalf of all balance sufferers, thank you so much for the work you do. And thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you.